afternoon. I'm Ryan Roney, curator at Telus Science Museum. And today we're going to talk about um, a major specimen that's in our gallery and just kind of tell you the story about Brontosaurus and the name returning. Um, first, I wanted to start with the picture that I have um, that was in our advertisement about um, this um, specimen, about this talk that I was going to give today. Oh, there's the sound. Okay, sorry, this is a whole new setup for us here, and I'm learning how to, to do this live. Um, hopefully, you all enjoy this as I will too. So, what's in a name? We have Brontosaurus, and it's a popular name, and it's a um, dinosaur that's been um, loved by children, and I remember growing up with my uh, Brontosaurus toys. Um, here is a picture of what might have looked like, and the problem, though, is this picture in front is the neck might be too high. A Brontosaurus actually has, um, it, it was more like a suspension bridge with its neck outstretched and its tail outstretched. So the picture back in the left is a bit more like what we think a Brontosaurus would actually look like in life. Um, and also this, the classic idea of Brontosaurus and other sauropods uh, walking through the, the marshes and the swamps probably wasn't the case when you're as big and heavy as you are and you're probably not going to have much traction under the mud. Um, they're thought to have eaten shrubs and bushes and, and trees and not the marsh grasses. But then there is some thought that they might have reached their necks out and eaten the marsh grasses. And so, but we weren't there to really know. So there's a lot of different things that we can think about, but this is a fun interpretation. And one other issue with this picture, even though it's a pretty picture, is back in the right, there's some kind of theropod. Um, that is not a T-Rex because um, Brontosauruses and other uh, sauropods lived in the, uh, in this group, the Brontosaurus and the Apatosaurus lived in the late uh, Jurassic and the Tyrannosaurus rex was in the late um, Cretaceous. And so I don't know what um, theropod they're trying to make in that picture. But when you come to Telus and you come enter the, the museum, one of the first things you see in our great hall is our specimen of a sauropod. And this is Brontosaurus parvus. Um, this is a copy of a specimen that's at the University of Wyoming. This specimen um, has a long history, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about why the name has changed over the years, because for most of the last most of the last century or more, it was called a Apatosaurus. But here today, it is. Oh, actually, let me pause. This gr this uh, specimen in the Great Hall. We s we have lots of events in our Great Hall around this specimen. People like having dinner beneath the tail and neck of this specimen. And uh, occasionally, we've had a few weddings actually here at the museum. Um, not only do they have them in the Great Hall, um, sometimes we have them in the planetarium. So uh, let's meet um, this specimen. Um, staff around here have, for years have called it Patty um, because it was called an Apatosaurus. Um, so let's kind of talk about that name change. And through that story of the name change, we're going to talk about the science of understanding sauropods and the, the science of how specimens are um, used to understand evolution and how within museums we track what specimens are what and how we keep these names of organisms with these specimens. So first off, the name of this is uh, Brontosaurus parvus. So that first part is the genus name. The second part is the species. But the name of a specimen of, a, of any species is the combination it's a binomial name. You have to keep both names together. It's not just Parvis. And when you talk about Brontosaurus, then you are talking about the group, the various species that are similar enough to be part of that group. So the, the names of species have these two parts, like Tyrannosaurus rex. Here we have Lambosaurus lambe, lambei and Albertosaurus sarcophagus, genus and species. Now, these names sometimes are based on Latin, giving some kind of um, description. Tyrannosaurus rex is the thunder lizard king. Um, Brontosaurus is thunder lizard. And then Lambosaurus is named after Lawrence Lambe. Um, and actually, he got named for both the genus and the species in this case. And Albertosaurus is named for the location, Alberta, Canada. We also have, at, at um, tell us, an, an Edmontosaurus. So that's named for Edmonton, which is the same area as that those dinosaurs. Now, the genus then is the grouping under which we put similar species. We look at features that bring them together. And of course, as you get bigger and bigger in l lumping things together, you get the group like today we're talking about a sauropod. So that brontosaurus is a sauropod. And, and so that's how you have your groups based on similarities. 
So, so when we talk about species, you have to give credit to who ga gave things the name. So Brontosaurus parvus, well, there's, a, there's something interesting about this one where I give credit. Around the author and the year they published it, I have a parenthesis there. That means that something changed in our understanding of what Peterson and Gilmore named. They named a species Elosaurus parvus, but this specimen of Brontosaurus that we have has been related to that, and Elosaurus parvus has become Brontosaurus. So we're gonna talk about how all that happens and why we have these changes, what that means in this story. So I can take genus and species and shorten it. Once I've introduced a name, I don't have to keep saying, writing Brontosaurus in literature, I'll say it, but I don't have to keep writing it. Save some ink when you, when you print stuff. So I can change the, these names. So Tyrannosaurus rex and Lambosaurus lambii and Albertosaurus sarcophagus become T. rex, L. lambii, and A. sarcophagus. Once we know what genera we're talking about, you can just shorten it and go. That's why everyone knows who T. rex is. So if I take Brontosaurus parvus, what do I do to shorten that name? It becomes B. parvus. It's very simple. So let's take a little walk through time and talk about this specimen and other related specimens that really will tell us about why we get this name today and why Brontosaurus as a name for these sauropods is back. Because there was a debate through the last few decades of is Brontosaurus real or not? Is it a patasaurus? Um, lots of people loved the name, so we're gonna talk about that. So uh, 2015, Brontosaurus parvus is the name that we have based on a paper, and we'll talk about that at the end. But let's go back to where this specimen was found. So this specimen um, found in Wyoming in the uh, Carnegie Quarry at the Morrison Formation. So this is an area that the group from the Carnegie Museum, um, where the Yale, Yale Carnegie, uh, I'm sorry, at the Carnegie Museum were collecting this. So, go, go further back in time though, Brontosaurus excelsus was the name that the specimen was first given. But this was not the specimen by which Brontosaurus excelsus was named. That specimen, also found in the Morris Formation, Morrison Formation, was collected by Othniel Charles Marsh. So he found that specimen in 1879. So next to the name, I have him getting the credit. But this is part of a time period where he was finding lots of different specimens. In fact, Othniel Marsh um, is the person who named the group Sauropod. So Sauropoda is, was his name, and he actually um, named a whole lot of genera in this group and a lot more species. And this is a big part. Here's the here is that original specimen that was named Brontosaurus excelsus. Um, this is in at the Yale um, Peabody Museum, and that's who Marsh worked for um, back then. And, in, and so Marsh found this. He also found Apatosaurus ajax. So the, this is, these are two of the genera that he found in the, in the sauropoda, and these are the names that we're talking about today to figure out what the name of the specimen we have here is, or rather the cast we have of a specimen here. So let's go back to that time period called the Bone Wars. So here's um, Dr. Marsh with, all of it, with some students. This is a summer um, internship for some college students. Uh, you don't get your internship today where they say, here's a gun, hope you come back alive. Um, that's kind of a, not the way things are done today. Um, and so they were out in the field looking for these specimens, collecting hundreds of dinosaur specimens, naming nearly as many species over the years. In fact, there was a big, that Marsh's team and, uh, and Cope's team were different groups. Marsh from Yale and Cope from uh, Philadelphia Academy of Sciences. So or the National Academy of Science in Philadelphia. They competed, they fought for um, credit and, and, and be, to be the most famous. And Marsh ends up naming the most species, Cope, um, not, not as many, but still a lot. Uh, the problem is, a lot of this was done hap, you know, hapdash. A lot of sloppy work. They um, just, any pieces of something that might be new, they gave it a name, and the last century has been spent kind of cleaning up that mess. Um, now back to that location with um, where the Carnegie group a few years later finds this specimen that we have that's called Brontosaurus excelsus at, the, at this time. 
Along with that specimen in the same locality, they found a specimen that later was named Elosaurus parvus. So, um, so here we have them thought to be different genus and species, and at this point, we now have three spe um, generic names and the species that are actually the type species for these genera. So when a new species is found and described, that species, bec that specimen becomes the reference to which everything else is compared. So that is the only one that actually has the name. So when I say something else is a Brontosaurus excelsus, I'm saying actually that that specimen is identical or close enough to the specimen that is Brontosaurus excelsus. Technically, it's not actually Brontosaurus excelsus. Only the named specimen is that name. It's the holder of that name. So it becomes kind of the, the flag bearer of that going forward. Now, when I say something is that species, we accept that that's what I'm talking about, that that is that. But it's kind of an interesting way to think about it. So when we talk about this further today, we also want to consider that each specimen has its specimen number. So when I want to refer to CM563, and I say that it's Brontosaurus excelsus in 1901, then I'm referring back to YPM 1980, which is the Brontosaurus excelsus described by Marsh. So these, this is how we're going to keep track of the story and understand what's going on. Now, type specimens and type species are very important because they are the basis on which we make these comparisons in science. This is the way that we can actually, as we find more things, better our categorization of things and understand the evolutionary processes that, ha that have happened. So there's all sorts of names for this is the specimen that is the type. There's actually copies of specimen, or you can actually make a copy of that specimen with a cast and then it can be uh, you know, a different type of type. And you can also take specimens from the same locality that, we, yes, we know they're the exactly the same. We'll, we'll store that hopefully at a different museum so that it's a point of comparison. Because one of the things about these type specimens, most museums that have them keep them separate from the general collections, extra security or extra protection from fire. Because sometimes things unfortunately happen to specimens. Um, you have. World War II, the museum in Berlin was bombed, and we had spec specimens from, um, from, from lots of material lost. And, and only in recent decades have we found, gotten new material from the same localities. One example is Spinosaurus. Um, the type material from Egypt was lost in these bombings. And on the right, we have the fire that happened a couple of years ago down at the museum in Brazil. We're still learning what got destroyed and what was saved and salvaged from that. And there were type specimens of, of both modern uh, material and also fossil material that was lost. Luckily, in the story of the sauropods, there's not been much of that material lost in, the, in that sense. But as we come forward, in 1903, a the Brontosaurus excelsus was recategorized. Um, by Riggs, and he, so that's where now the Marsh name, because it's the name for the species, gets parentheses on it, because somebody else changed the genus. So Apatosaurus excelsus is now what we consider um, Brontosaurus excelsus as of 1903. Um, so that comes going forward. At this point, Apatosaurus is the name for this group, because they think Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus are so closely related that they belong together. Some errors were propagated early on that they had the wrong skull on there. It actually was a Camarasaurus skull that they thought went with that. Um, but really the grouping came together because of the similarity of the pelvis of these two, of these, uh, these species. Um, but what happens when you try to take, okay, these two genera are the same, the, gen gen the genus named first is the one that takes precedence. So because Apatosaurus was named before Brontosaurus, that group, because we now think that they are the same genus, can, goes forward as a patasaurus. So from 1903 onward, it all is collectively considered a patasaurus. However, Brontosaurus was just such a cool name, and people liked it. They liked Thunder Lizard, and so it was popular. And in fact, Yale never actually changed its label for up until the 90s, 
and it just kept being a debate. And in 1989, when the U.S. Postal Service issued a stamp of these um, dinosaurs, they put the name Brontosaurus on there, even though technically at the time was not scientifically valid. Um, but ignoring the debate and just going with what was popular with the people and the name people used, we got that. There's lots of great toys that were called Brontosaurus, um, and I had some as a kid that I played with. So the specimen that is now known as Apatosaurus excelsus that was collected um, in 1901, it just stayed at the Carnegie Institute um, for, for years and was not actually put on exhibit. So the University of Wyoming acquired that and mounted it, and they got that, and it was, that's when it was put up in 1961. So at that point, it was still identified as a Patasaurus excelsus. So with this new home, that's where it resided for, for, for a few decades. Um, and, as, and during this time period, research was going where they were figuring out that the skulls that they thought before were not correct, and continued through time at trying different types of skulls, and finding, finally finding material that was enough to associate the correct skull with the skeletons that we have. So one of the things that's interesting about these original, these specimens was we, the skulls, they didn't have intact skulls. They had what they called postcranial skeletons. Um, so now that we have an idea, the research, and it took almost 100 years from the naming of Brontosaurus excelsus and now called Apatosaurus excelsus to have even the type of skull that it and the other apatosaurines had. Um, mainly because a lot of this material is mixed up between other material of other gr sauropod groups in the Morrison formation. Let's fast forward to 2004. We have a study um, done by um, Upchurch. Um, Upchurch et al. in 2004, this is, they found a specimen of Apatosaurus ajax. This was a really good, complete specimen. The Tokyo National Museum National Science Museum um, got that um, specimen. They did a really in-depth study. And so what they did is they compared it to 11 other specimens of Apatosaurus, um, looking at features of the skeletons. Now features, when we look at them in, in a analysis like this, we call characters. And so then these, these characters in this analysis, um, actually, let me step back. We now have, we have to look at the specimens. So here we have the 11 specimens. So again, back that specimen number as our way of tracking what was in the study. So the four specimens we've talked about were in that study. So these four plus uh, another seven specimens were in that study that Upchurch did. And so when we do these studies, we talk about the operational taxonomic unit. Because we have the specimens that have been named, we've got various names they've had over time. So when we study them, sometimes we step back not quite certain what the names are of the newer material, so we're trying to find how they relate to the stuff that has those set names, and that's what we do in this study. So here is the results from that study. We have those various names and the names we've been talking about, and you can see where those specimens fall out in this study and where you get Apatosaurus ajax, Apatosaurus parvus, and the brunt Apatosaurus excelsus. So one of the things that was interesting about this study is it took that Elosaurus parvus and the specimen that we have here at TELUS, that's the original material is in Wyoming, put those two together. So originally, the, the larger specimen was thought to be Brontosaurus excelsus, and Elosaurus parvus was just a smaller, different genus. Well, it turns out Elosaurus is actually a juvenile form and the other specimen we have is the adult form. So these two are here combined as the same species because Elosaurus parvus has the species name, but it's related to these other Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus species, and currently we're calling them Apatosaurus. Here we now have the combination, a new combination of Apatosaurus parvus. So when TELUS opened 11 years ago, we actually got a cast made of the material in Wyoming. And when that cast was made, we were able to take that material, they got it remounted, and we got this new large 
really awesome cast of this, of this specimen. It's 82 feet long. It's, it's one of the, the larger brontosaurids. Actually, a lot of other apatosauri, a, um, a lot of the other apatosaurs are, can be a bit larger. And so we have now this story here going on. So the names through the years. But when we put up the cast here at TELUS, we called it Apatosaurus excelsus. We were a little behind on the research, and for the next 10, 10 years, it was called Apatosaurus excelsus out in, our, out in our lobby, or out in our great hall. So let's fast forward now to 2015. We have this amazing study um, done by Emmanuel Schopp and his colleagues. Um, let me find my notes, sorry. They weren't just looking at Apatosaurus in this study. They actually were looking at all the dip, dip, uh, diplodocoids and actually an even bigger group, the Diplodocidae. This is about half of the sauropod groups you have there. These are the ones that are more like the stretched out suspension bridges and not the other groups like the Brachiosaurs with the giraffe-like um, um, upright stance of their necks. So within this study, they had 81 operational taxonomic units. So that was basically 81 specimens, some with names that were type specimen names, others associated with other things, but because they had complete enough skeletons, they were really important for looking at these groups. 49 of these were part of the Diplodocidae. The other ones were really good specimens for comparison. Because if you're looking at one group that you think is similarly related, you need to have groups that, you, that are closely related but different enough to help you confirm that hypothesis. You can't just say, I'm going to look at a patasaurus and see how a patasaurus comes out. Or I'm going to look at um, the plotacoids and see how they come out. You have to actually include more related groups to really see the patterns. And that's another important part about this study. So we talked about characters a second ago. Um, characters are those features that, are, that you can characterize between different um, specimens. So here they looked at 477 characters. This was a huge study. In fact, the paper that reports all this is over 300 pages long. The, um, and they set up a criteria beforehand of what would make a genus. How are we going to lump species together into these related groups that we call genera? They, they said, we're going to have so many unique um, characters, so many unique features to create these, these combinations of, of genera. They, they did this study, they put all these things in here, and here are where the specimens we've been talking about fall out in this study. So we have the group, the Brontosaurus and the Apatosaurus groups are together and related, but we now have a robust result telling us that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus are actually slightly different. This, is, this was big news to the people who like the name Brontosaurus. Um, some of the things that actually make the group different um, are just features on the neural spines, on the, on the dorsal neural spines. Um, you have area in the, sh the scapula, basically on the shoulder blade. And then you have a few other features um, along in, in the skeleton. But it's just minor features, but they, they combined, and there were enough of them that it separated Brontosaurus from Apatosaurus. Now, when you look at the bigger um, study, um, his focus of this paper was not actually Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus. He was looking at the, the group label un underneath in white below my, uh, my, my highlights here. So I've put an arrow there to mark our specimen that we have a copy of. But so we see it within the Brontosaurus um, genus now. But he was looking at Diplodocidae and the dip, Diplodocoids within Diplodocidae. And since then, in the five years since, there's been more than 100 papers that have cited this paper and the results of the paper. Only a few have just cited the results about Brontosaurus with no commentary or criticism. But the majority of papers that have responded to this have continued the conversation about the relationships within the Diplodocids, not within all of Diplodocidae. So it's really interesting that when he did the study, that what the goal of the study was not to, I'm going to make sure Brontosaurus is back and that it's right. 
It's actually something that the data told us. It was something that came out from their early on at the start, they said, hey, we're going to set this as our parameter, and it came out in the wash. So coming through this story, um, these are the names that have been used. Um, you can see now in, in squares the, the names of the specimen that we have here at TELUS. You have it being found in 1901, um, it moving, that specimen moving to the University of Wyoming in 1961, now with the name Apatosaurus excelsus. Um, in 2004, the naming name was updated, and then we have, in 2015, the further update and the restoration of the name Brontosaurus. So now that I have this information, out in the Great Hall, next to this cast of, of, of Brontosaurus parvus, we have a femur, and this is a real bone that we have in our collection, not the cast that you're seeing. And Initially, it was labeled Apatosaurus excelsus, which matched the name that we were using for the specimen, for, for, the, for this cast. Now, do I just update it to Brontosaurus excelsus with that update? But then again, the cast we have is being updated to Brontosaurus parvus. So there's a question, is this Brontosaurus excelsus or Brontosaurus parvus that this leg bone came from? Knowing that it was compared to a specimen that was thought to be a Brontosaurid, I can accept that it was Brontosaurus, but I don't have enough information at this point to tell whether it is Excelsis or Parvis. So I have it labeled as Brontosaurus species. So it is a Brontosaurus femur, but of which species that is in question. So I leave it in what's called open nomenclature. So going forward, I could, I, I'm going to look at some of the characters that were in that um, shop paper and try and see if I can figure that out. But that's going to take a little bit of effort. And maybe when you come in, the, uh, the plaque there will be updated. So coming into the future, uh, you know, this has been a century of studies and research that have gone on that have been updating this name and changes within our understanding of sauropods. Here's a picture of uh, Brontosaurus. So the head can be raised up a little bit in the current understanding. Maybe not as much as what you had in the first painting um, at the beginning. And going forward, who knows what more is going to be done about the, the, the group in Diplodocidae, what's going to be learned about the rest of sauropods. Another paper that came out in 2017 took the grouping that put sauropods and theropods together as a separate group from ornithopods within dinosaurs and actually put ornithopods and theropods together and put sauropods at the base of the tree of dinosaurs. So there's lots of questions and, and things happening, but it just depends on how the data comes together. Now in preparation for this talk, I got a lot of questions from people, um, and I wanna see if I can respond to some of those. And a few other questions, if I don't actually respond to you today, I'm going to get online and write up the responses to, to those, if I can get. this pad to open. There we go. So I had, how many bones does Brontosaurus have compared to Apatosaurus? Well, Sophie, um, who asked that question, they actually have the same bones. There's not a, a real difference in there. There might be some difference in um, the, the tail bones, but I don't actually have those counts they have on that, but in general, they're, 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 these two are pretty similar. What made the groups different are features on the bones. Um, so I hopefully, uh, Gabriella Dunlap had a question about why do we go back to Br Brontosaurus. Hopefully the discussion today has already answered that. So um, I'm, let's go on here. Um, so, we have a young boy named Michael who wants to know about becoming a paleontologist and working with dinosaurs. Um, a lot of times you get into paleontology by studying paleontology in school in a geology program. Some students come the other way through biology and then go into paleontology in grad school. But either way, you can get to that point and, and study um, those, but you definitely need to go to college to do um, some of that work. But there's a lot of people also, go ahead and get involved now with local cl clubs 
Um, here in Georgia, there's the Paleontology Association of Georgia. So a lot of people that aren't necessarily professionals or have even gone to school for it, but they are out there looking for fossils and know a lot about, about these fossils and can guide you in that too. But also come by the museum when we have our events and I'd be glad to talk to you more about that. How big would a baby brontosaurus have been? Well, the baby brontosaurus is limited by the size of the eggs. Um, the eggs of brontosaurus you'd think would have been really huge, but they're not much larger, they would not have been much larger than what you see from an emu or an ostrich because there's a point at which an egg is too big for oxygen to get through the, the, that egg. So you had, would have had a small brontosaurus that I could have probably held in my arms that becomes the big animal that it is. What's really cool about brontos, um, sauropods is those, the, 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 dement, the proportions of the animal actually don't change as much through its, through its life as other, other animals do. Uh, we talk about human babies with their big heads and tiny bodies and toddlers with you know, short arms that can't reach around their heads. But, but sauropods don't actually change in dimension. It's, just, it's a really interesting feature about them. Um, so how wide was a Bronto's foot? Um, I don't know the exact measurements, but if you see the specimen out there, um, about as big as this lectern I'm in front of, um, certainly would have squashed you. Um, could a brontosaurus jump? I doubt it. Um, brontosaurus, though, was one group, and apatosaurus. They actually could climb a little bit with the front. The back feet still on the ground, but they actually had a claw on the front feet, and they would have actually gone up against a tree and climbed up to reach even higher than the brachiosaurus. Um, how did brontosaurus mate? Well, we don't know how any of the sauropods mated, and the size and... Um, and just, yeah, that's just a good question. You got your, they're, they're really large, just maybe one day they'll figure that out. Um, how many predators did bron brontosaurus horses really have? Um, well, that's a good question. As big as they are, it'd be pretty hard for something to attack it. And it's even thought that the tail it had could have been used as a whip to defend or to signal. Um, but again, we weren't there to see what's going on. Um, I, I guess the thing to do, and I'll double check in the literature, is see what they have of evidence of um, markings on the brontosaurus bones, probably from scavengers, but sometimes if something would have attacked it, and you can tell what it was, there could be scar tissue. This is an area that a lot of um, paleontologists have, so I'll have to go look in the literature and find that out. Could a bronto crush a whole car or only part of it? Well, its feet aren't as wide as a whole car, so wherever it stepped, it would certainly have crushed the car. Um, and speed, I doubt that they were quick, but they certainly walked many dis long distances throughout the day as they um, ate lots and lots of food and had to m keep moving to, um, to get the food they needed. It's thought that they did range for miles on any given day. Could they swim? With the weight they had, um, swimming probably would have been difficult and actually it, they would have gone down deep enough that there would have been enough water pressure to potentially affect their lungs ability to actually um, breathe. So you might not have been, a, the, so the idea of a sauropod in the water with its head out probably didn't happen. Um, you're looking at, you go down in the water just a few feet, you, you can feel the pressure in your ears. Think about you're that big, you go down deep and all that water on you and you're trying to, in your lungs, as big as they are, trying to move to get enough oxygen for your body, it's probably not. Um, how long would their lifespan be? Um, decades. Um, the sauropod that we have is thought to be an adult. Um, that is 82 feet long, maybe got a little bit bigger, um, probably close to 20 or so. Um, the t they, they have they're thought to have um, teenage years that are pretty similar to timing as, as modern humans, but uh, who knows how long they lived. Um, so that Elosaurus parvus that was the type species that is the juvenile um, was probably um, um, uh, um, 9, 10, 11 years old, and then you get to the bigger one we have now. Um, mannerisms about Brontosaurus. Um, I don't know a lot about them, but if you want to have some fun 
um, ideas out there from sauropods. Look up what Bob Bakker has, has taught about that, um, various sauropods, and he, he thinks of lots of crazy ideas for them. Um, some probably happened, some didn't, but you've got to be creative. Um, so, and I guess, do I have any other questions? I guess the last question I have is from Ian Oakes. When a brontosaurus is putting cream cheese on the bagel, does he start his spread from the left side or the right side? Well, as big as his feet are, I think he would crush the bagel. And the cream cheese would be, would be just smoothed out on it anyway. So if you have any other questions, go ahead and put them down below, and uh, I will come back and respond to them. Um, thank you for today's um, attendance, and hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did.